Hey there, and welcome to another Spartan Space with Synthetics and the Synthetics Ambassadors. This is where you bring on interesting protocols across DeFi to bring awareness to the great products that they're building. These calls are recorded live on Discord, Twitter, and other mediums, but we've brought them to you so that you can listen to them at your own convenience. My name is Matt, and I'm here with Millie and Mojo. Let's get started. Thank you everyone for coming as well. Um, this is another SNX Spartan Space on Twitter Spaces with the Synthetics Ambassadors. Uh, we're here with uh, the folks behind TBTC. Um, folks behind it are uh, guys over at Threshold Network. So first, what I'll do is, uh, is I'll pass it over to McLean from Threshold Network, and I'll, I'll have him give a brief intro of himself, and then a brief intro of uh, TBTC, and then we'll kind of get into uh, a little bit more of the topics of discussion for today. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Um, nice to be here, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'm McLean Wilkinson. I am one of the uh, co-founders of New Cypher, uh, which is one of the precursor projects to, to Threshold. And we can probably talk about the history uh, in a little bit later in this call. Um, TBTC is an application that just launched on Threshold uh, two days ago. It is a decentralized, permissionless, scalable uh, Bitcoin bridge to Ethereum and potentially to you know, L2s and, and other other chains in the future. Um, right now, basically, as far as I'm aware, given the, the shutdown of, of REN BTC, it's essentially the only uh, viable permissionless bridge um, if you want to wrap Bitcoin uh, to Ethereum and, and deploy that into DeFi. Um, so super excited to, to talk with you all about that and... Um, in, uh, in the launch that we uh, sort of, like, I guess, probably are still going through right now, given it's only been about 48 hours. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. No, I, I, I think what you guys are doing with TBTC is, is super important, um, I, especially with the closing of REN and, you know, all these centralized actors and not wanting to take the same custodial risk. Um, so, yeah, here, let's, let's kind of talk a little bit about the the history of threshold and 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 how it came to be i, I think i think that's a very important part of the story is there's an on-chain merger there's some there's some of this like very interesting um DeFi stuff that we don't typically see every day yeah absolutely so i, I think i'll maybe even to start i'll even go back before the the actual merger um new cypher along with keep are, are the two sort of precursor projects um that came together to form threshold uh, I was one of the co-founders of, of New Cipher, along with Mish Will from from Curve. Uh, we started the project uh, back in 2016, um, and the idea was to create basically like a data privacy or access control layer for the apps. Uh, so basically, a way to <clears throat> gate like who can and can't access uh, data inside of a, a decentralized application. Um, obviously, it's kind of a difficult problem because by default, everything on Ethereum and other public blockchains is, is well public. Uh, so we had been working on that for uh, a while. Um, we launched on, on mainnet in October of 2020. Uh, and then in early 2021, uh, a few community members from, from New Cypher and Keep sort of came up with the idea given that the two projects were quite similar from an architecture standpoint, both were working on um, various types of threshold cryptography with, with New Cypher, it was something called proxy re-encryption and with Keep it was uh, distributed key generation and threshold signatures. Um, the community members had the idea of like, what, what would happen if instead of each of these fairly similar projects going along on their own and you know, probably at some point being directly competitive, uh, what would happen if we just rolled these up into one larger project and combined the communities, had multiple dev teams contributing, uh, combined all the stakers, all the applications that were running on, on either network would now be running on one. Um, and would that basically just be a, a kind of a scenario where one plus one would, would hopefully equal something a lot more than two. Um, so it's, it was very interesting, this sort of process of, of, not exactly a merger, but I think it's it's the closest word we have to describe what happened. Um, but basically, this this mashup of two distinct networks uh, into one, and 
there was a process, a series of, um, of governance proposals on, on each project's uh, governance forums and the communities with the help of, of the dev teams kind of iterated to find a, a solution to how to do this integration or this merger in a way that was, um, that made sense for, for both, both projects and both communities. Um, so that actually went live uh, January 1 of last year. So that in 2022, um, if you have had or still have new or keep tokens, you're able to upgrade those into T tokens, which is uh, the native token for a threshold. Um, and each each community got essentially 50% of the initial supply with um, a newly minted um, amount of T going to capitalize the threshold DAO, which um, is controlled by token holders. Um, so that was kind of a, a very interesting and also sort of difficult experience because effectively this was the first time that two fairly large projects had merged into into one um, and there was a lot of learnings that we had from that process that you know if there are other other similar um, combinations in the future I think you know they can certainly learn a lot from what we did just by going back and and reading some of those old governance posts Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think there's, I think there's definitely a lot to be learned, a lot of, a, a lot of takeaways from this process, uh, especially the fact that that two protocols that are doing very similar things on the architectural side, uh, there can be a lot of benefit in in, in combining together and, and working together towards a towards a future that you guys both want to see. Um, would definitely, would would definitely love to see a lot of crypto projects um, take from that. Um, and then take from this this quote unquote like merger side of things as well, uh, even though it's probably not the the best word to use it. Uh, but but anyway, here let's let's go a little bit into um, TBTC. Uh, but but first off, I, I I think it's best to to look at this from a lens of like the issues of centralized Bitcoin on Ethereum. Do you, do you have like any any thoughts on centralized Bitcoin on Ethereum and and, and what sort of issues this this poses across DeFi? Sure. And I mean, maybe the best way is to start from like a, from the super basics, like explain like I'm five, like what does it even mean to wrap Bitcoin or to use Bitcoin on Ethereum and DeFi? And you know, probably most people in this space are familiar, but basically Ethereum and Bitcoin are two entirely separate blockchains that are entirely unaware of each other. Um, if you have BTC on the Bitcoin blockchain, there's no way for you to use that in all of the amazing and emerging uh, decentralized finance tools and, and primitives um, that essentially live almost entirely today on Ethereum. Um, and so there's been a variety of ways that people have tried to solve that. Uh, probably the, I think the first and the most straightforward is just have some centralized custodian. So this is essentially how WBTC works. You have a centralized custodian, uh, in this case, it's BitGo, who, if you have Bitcoin, you can send them your Bitcoin. And in exchange, they will give you back a, a uh, ERC-20 representation of that Bitcoin on the Ethereum blockchain. And you can use that ERC-20 WBTC um, the same way you can use you know, any token on Ethereum. You can use it as collateral to yield farm, to borrow, to lend, to do all the cool things that you know, we, we want to do. Uh, obviously, there's some you know, drawbacks with that approach. Um, one, you know, obviously, you're, you're heavily relying on that centralized custodian to, one, be honest, which you know, in terms of WBTC is probably a fair assumption. Um, but you, there are a lot of built-in assumptions around like business continuity, um, you know, around their compliance requirements in terms of who they can do business with from a KYC uh, perspective. You know, it's not permissionless if you want to mint WBTC. Um, essentially, BitGo or their merchants have to affirm that they want to do business with you. Uh, and so there's been a few uh, other approaches that have kind of emerged. One was, you know, essentially what RemBTC was, was a, more or less the same thing as WBTC, except... They're basically just like, we will do business with anyone. You can permissionlessly bridge. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of, of RemBTC, which we saw with the fallout of FTX and Alameda, is the bridge itself, while permissionless, wasn't actually decentralized. So 
Alameda happened to to own uh, the Ren Labs uh, or the Ren Bridge in in a sense, and so when they went bust, that bridge essentially got turned off. Um, there's been the other big approach is like creating synthetic assets. Obviously, if you know, I'm sure everyone in this call is familiar with with how that works. Um, you can over collateralize, uh, for example, with SBTC, um, and then you don't have to worry about bridging at all. Um, obviously, like that is uh, in some ways more expensive because obviously you have to over collateralize. So you have to put down more capital than, than you're actually getting out in terms of the, the SBTC, but you know, it has a lot of positive approaches and that you're not worrying about bridging uh, at all. And bridging is you know, fundamentally probably one of the thorniest problems in all of crypto, as we've seen with the sort of incessant and continual uh, major exploits uh, on major bridges over the last year or two. Um, what TBTC tries to do, and there was a prior V1 of TBTC that, that ran on the Keep network, and obviously what we're going to focus on today with, is the V2 of TBTC that runs on Threshold, but both, both projects essentially tried to create a maximally decentralized and trust-minimized bridge um, so that you could permissionlessly take Bitcoin from the Bitcoin blockchain, wrap it for uh, a tokenized representation called TBTC on the Ethereum blockchain. But instead of having that centralized custodian in the middle, you're replacing that centralized custodian with a decentralized network of nodes um, in such a way that, you know, there's no concern over, you know, that custodian going bankrupt or, you know, being compromised in, in any way. Um, and I think, you know, I'm optimistic that with with V2, we've achieved that, um, but in a in a more scalable way than V1. And I'm happy to get into the details of, of why V1 was, I think, a great proof of concept, but ultimately wasn't able to uh, to capture the market share um, that it had originally set out to, to capture, which which hopefully we'll be able to do with V2. Yeah, yeah, I I, I think that's a really great transition. Like, what what were the learnings of TBTC V1? that then went into how TBTC V2 was built. Yeah. So basically the, the way that V1 worked is it replaced that centralized custodian with a two of, of three uh, signer set. So there was basically the Bitcoin was custodied by um, a threshold signature composed of three stakers sampled from the Keep network. And then it was over collateralized uh, those signers had to over collateralize with Ethereum. So they had to bond, I believe it was 100 150% of the value of the Bitcoin that they were custodying uh, with ETH that they would essentially deposit or, or bond. Um, and so this was a very like, an economically secure approach because obviously like even if those signers collude to steal the underlying Bitcoin, the protocol would just liquidate the bonded ETH and make the depositor whole. Uh, but of course, it's very expensive. Um, <clears throat> so like the minting capacity of TBTCB1 was very constrained because every time someone wanted to mint a Bitcoin, a bunch of signers had to put down 150% uh, of that Bitcoin down in ETH. And I think B1 happened to launch roughly at the same time as, uh, as, as ETH 2.0 staking. So like they were hit with a double whammy of one, it's just expensive in general. And now two, they're, they're competing with, with ETH staking yields. And so in practice, like the TBTC V1 just kind of tapped out in terms of its ability to scale and to support uh, new BTC mints. Um, what we learned from V2 or with V2, basically we changed a couple things. One, V2 gets rid of that uh, ETH over collateralization requirements entirely. So signers don't have to put down ETH at all. So there's essentially no, well, not no, but there's no real meaningful sort of scaling limit uh, on that front in terms of minting. Uh, and what it does instead is it greatly expands the signer sets. So instead of a signer set of, of three stakers, it's, it has wallets that are 51 of 100 sampled from uh, threshold network stakers. And then it, it has this honest majority assumption uh, with regular 
a weekly wallet rotation. And then everything is backstopped uh, by something called the coverage pools, which is essentially like a decentralized SAPU uh, insurance fund. Um, and so that's how B Bitcoin is custodied. Um, and then at launch, we actually went to market with something called optimistic minting, which we can talk a bit about as well, um, which is how sort of the deposits on the Bitcoin side are, are recognized and, and turned into TBTC. Um, but there's sort of a want to make a distinction between the custody piece, which is done by all the threshold stakers and the actual minting of TBTC piece, uh, which is done currently under this optimistic model uh, using a permission set of, um, of DAOs, including synthetics as, as minters, and then uh, a few other DAOs and uh, a lot of uh, threshold community members and DeFi OGs as uh, a second set of permissioned actors in the system that are, are called guardians and are essentially watching and making sure that minters are, are doing what they're supposed to be doing um, and not sort of uh, fraudulently um, minting TBTC that's not backed by any actual Bitcoin deposits. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you make a, a ton of great points in there. I just, just want to bring one thing back up. Um, as it was related to how V1 was launched, you, you could effectively say that the, the collateralization of um, uh, TBTC V1 was effectively like a synthetic, uh, pretty much like a synthetic Bitcoin in a sense, like in terms of the collateral requirements that were required. Yeah. You pretty much had people having to bond 150% ETH, which is, yes, while it is extremely secure and, you know, helps to helps to secure the this the security of the network and these guarantees and so on it's it's just so capital efficient that that people just have a very hard time using it yeah I that's think that's, you, that's that's exactly right so like obviously like in b1 it you know it is not a synthetic in the sense that there is actually like a deposit of bitcoin on the yeah. other side but it does have the same kind of onerous capital requirements of it's uh, of a synthetic and that you have to or, or signers not the actual bitcoin depositors but signers custom the bitcoin have to put up uh, quite a significant amount of collateral. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Just, just want to really hammer that point down. And then you, you walk into these like roles of uh, of these different users. Um, would you mind? I, I think first off, we can kind of take that from a realm of like, what is this optimistic minting, and how do these users, like, like these different stakeholders, play a role in it? These guardians, these minters, and 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 so on. Yeah. So the. Uh, the initial design of V2 um, actually did not have optimistic minting. And the way deposits would work is that they were entirely permissionless. Uh, and, <clears throat> and stakers, in addition to custodying the Bitcoin, uh, any staker could sort of affirm um, that a deposit was made. Um, and this is what we called sweeping. So they would sweep deposits and basically propose a mint. Uh, that is just a very um, technically complex uh, piece to implement and was kind of like the one of the remaining kind of blockers to, to shipping to mainnet. And I think it became increasingly clear, like when, when Ren BTC uh, was shut down that like we needed to ship something secure um, and usable, you know, now. Um, and so we came up with this optimistic minting approach, which, allows us to kind of defer the sweeping, permissionless sweeping uh, mechanism to later, uh, and instead use this um, slightly more permissioned approach of having a, a set of minters and a set of guardians, which are permissioned roles. And the minters are uh, seven major DAOs, um, so Synthetics, Curve, um, and Al Al Alchemix, Euler, and a few others. Uh, and they are responsible for watching the Bitcoin blockchain and seeing if a valid deposit has been made into the TBTC bridge. And if a valid deposit has been made in the TBTC bridge, the minters have this special permissioned, uh, uh, permission of initiating a TBTC mint. And once they have initiated a TBTC mint, there is a, a three-hour period before that mint is finalized. 
in which a second set of uh, a second permissioned role, which is called guardians, are able to check that that mint request is valid and that the minter basically did uh, did what it's supposed to do. Um, and if the minter didn't, for whatever reason, it you know was malicious or compromised or, or some, something happened, uh, guardians are able to block that mint request uh, in that three hour period and prevent TBTC that's not actually backed by native Bitcoin from being minted. Um, and each of those roles is one of N. So basically you're addressing as long as you have one honest minter, uh, mint requests can't be censored. So if, if, if you're depositing Bitcoin and you go to one of the minters and they ignore you or they decline to mint for you, you can just go find another one. And as long as one of them is honest and, and, and live, uh, your mint request will get broadcast. And then as long as one of the guardians is honest and not colluding to help minters create false uh, mint requests that aren't backed by anything, then the system is secure and will be collateralized by actual Bitcoin. That's great. No, that is a that is a fantastic explainer into the system. And just to just to clarify to the audience here, um, these guardians, who exactly are the guardians and, and, and how are they selected? Yeah, so the guardians are um, it's actually a longer list uh, than the mentors. Um, so it's a combination of <clears throat> a few uh, other projects and DAOs. Uh, so I think the list of, of projects is currently uh, Entropy, which is um, you know, started by some ex new Cypher uh, team members. Um, they're a, a very interesting uh, decentralized special cryptography project working on on um, sort of custody and like decentralized fire blocks in a way. Uh, Catalog, which is an interesting project focused on cross chain swaps. Uh, Badger DAO, which you know, obviously is the big Bitcoin focused um, you know curve curve layer. And Stake DAO, um, which is uh, yeah, similar to uh, like it's a competitor to Convex and another curve curve layer. Uh, and then there's a, a whole bunch of community members, so a bunch of devs from the New Cipher and Keep teams, uh, including myself, a bunch of other community members drawn from from the Threshold DAO, uh, who have been longstanding and you know, technically competent um, contributors. And actually, the the individuals. Um, uh, can self-nominate to be a guardian on the threshold governance forums. Um, so that's still possible. We're adding guardians in batches. So if you, you know, if that's something that resonates with you and you want to get involved, that might be an interesting way for, for some folks to, to contribute to the network. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's also really important to, to, to reiterate what you said before um of of how these two permission roles operate in terms of if there is one mentor who is acting honest on uh, you know if 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 in a in a horrible worst case scenario if all these other mentors are refusing to um to mint btc that has been or tbtc that has been deposited on the bitcoin network if there is one honest mentor then everything can still continue and the same thing is with guardians if there's one honest guardian that is blocking mentors from colluding then everything can still continue. Um, yeah. And obviously that, that is still, that is a very important part of, of, of how this optimistic uh, minting actually, um, actually continues. And then when, when you put um, a large amount of guardians and a large amount of mentors that are, that are like trusted and, um, you know, have, have these like rep uh, these reputations to uh, uphold as well, um, you can be reasonably certain that, you know, this, this will maintain, um, and that these folks will, will act honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think from a, a protocol design perspective, it's, it's very robust. This is, it's not like a multi-sig where if, you know, a, a quorum of folks collude, then like you're, you're wrecked. As long as one mentor is honest and live, then the system is, you know, liveness is guaranteed. As long as one guardian is honest and live, then the security and collateralization of the system is, is guaranteed. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's better security guarantees than most alt L ones and you know the L twos that are out there and so on. So that is a that is a very fantastic bar to to be at. I, I think people should note that, right? 
Um, so from, from there though, I think it's interesting of like in the future, um, what does this process look like without these permission guardians? I, I, I just want to go back to that. I know you kind of spoke on it a little bit prior to this, yep. but yeah. So the, uh, the idea is that, um, this optimistic minting model will eventually just be like a, a quick minting option. Uh, and then the sort of main minting model will be the original sweeping, um, which I think that's probably going to, you know, current, current estimates are that that sweeping will land in you know, about two or three months. Um, and so it, once that's landed, even if 100% of the minters are offline, uh, you will still be able to permissionlessly mint uh, after, a DP, uh, after a Bitcoin deposit. Um, and then we'll, pro we'll still keep the optimistic minting model running, but as kind of like a quick minting option. Um, so if you're depositing, let's say, like a smaller amount of, of BTC, um, you may be able to use the optimistic approach um, in, in order to just get across the bridge um, more quickly. Got it. Got and, the way, it. and the way sweeping um, works is that any staker on the network can essentially like sweep a Bitcoin deposit and, and initiate a, a, a mint. Yeah, no, no, this is it's a great point to make. I, I just got a great question from, from, from Millie in the audience. Um, when, when disputes like are initiated, how are they actually settled? Like if, if someone was to try to, you know, like let's just say a minter was to try to make a false um, mint of TBTC, um, how exactly would, would this settlement happen? Like the guardian calling it out? Yeah. So a guardian can unilaterally block a, uh, a mint request. Um, all the guardians are essentially running like a, a guardian bot who's, who's obviously sort of automated this. Um, and then as like a, a backup, like a guardian could theoretically, let's say like a, a malicious minter was had figured out a way to like DOS all of the um, all the guardians um, as a sort of emergency backup. You could also do this just via um, ether scan um, directly on on the contract. Um, so obviously, like theoretically, a guardian uh, could for a period of time essentially DOS the system by blocking valid mint requests, um, but then they would be able to be removed from their guardian role by the, the threshold council, which is an elected multi-sig um, that basically can add and, <clears throat> add and remove uh, addresses to this, this whitelist for both guardians and minters. Um, so that's like the, obviously like that's kind of a, a bad scenario is like a rogue guardian could for some period of time censor mints. Um, but, you know, that's like the worst case because that guardian would just be removed and then the mint request could go through after the fact. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes a great deal of sense. So, and so, so an absolute worst case is this threshold council stepping in to, to, to remove, you know, like rogue guardians. Um, but even then rogue guardians pretty much just means that the system isn't like TBTC isn't being moved. It like, like can't be minted at that time. But this is the overall worst case. It's not that uh, TBTC is being minted uncontrollably, um, which I think is a is a very interesting thing. For, Correct. For well, to well know, the, right? that's you the worst case you... from the perspective of, of a, a rogue guardian. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. That is a. That's that actually serves as a as a great segue into into the next question. So I think we've kind of walked through TBTC in a in a, in a pretty good uh, side of things. Um, when it comes to tokenomics and the T token, how does the threshold token actually factor into decentralizing this process? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the T token is essentially a work token. So if you want to run a node for threshold, you have to stake the T token. Um, and then threshold is actually interesting because obviously we're talking about TPTC today, but threshold is actually a multi-application uh, network. So by staking the T token, you can, of course, run a TPTC signer, but you can also run a node for um, the access control piece that you know we haven't really talked about today. Uh, but that's a lot of the, the 
the um, contribution to the network that New Cipher had made around proxy re-encryption and so forth. Um, but to, <clears throat> and you can reuse the same stake uh, for, for all applications on the network. So with the same T-stake, you can operate a TPTC signer, a PRE node, and you know, to the extent that other applications are added to the network in the future, you'll be able to run those as well. Uh, and then um, the incentive for people to stake and to run nodes is an inflation reward subsidy. Um, and if you run all the apps on the network, you've kind of maxed out your, your, um, your earnings from that perspective. Got it, got it. And then alongside um, this, this incentive to stake uh, for inflation, is there a fee to, to, to mint TBTC? Yeah, so currently the fee um, to cross the bridge is 0.2%. Um, which I believe right now WPTC is like 0.25%. So it's more, more cost, uh, it's more affordable than the WPTC at the moment to bridge. That is a, um, a, a governorable parameter. So the DAO could have an on-chain vote essentially to adjust the fee up or down. Um, and all fees that are generated by the network accrue to the DAO's treasury, which is, you know, an on-chain Governor Bravo contract. Um, and then uh, the the DAO can you know have a on chain proposal to deploy that those fees um, in whatever way they, they want. Whether I think there's some interesting ideas around deploying that as liquidity and you know a curve pool, for example, or using it to um, you know to, to potentially repurchase T or you know a variety of, of different ideas. Um, I think are on the table there. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So, so all, all of these fees that are generated go to this, go to this treasury council stock. Well, rather the Dow treasury. I'm I'm using synthetic terms to describe some of these things, but goes to the Dow treasury, yep. and then and then from there, governance proposals are used and approved by the the threshold council to decide where to deploy these assets for whatever amount of time or, yeah, whatever they want to be used for. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And, and, and that could serve as a, as a really good path to, to like bootstrapping TBTC in terms of like liquidity and, 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 and other tools that, that need to be deployed before you start distributing fees to stakers or, or anything. Right. Because it's, it, it's very mature. It's, it's very premature to be, to, to be doing things like that. Yeah. I mean, and ultimately it's up to token holders to do what they want to do with those fees. Um, but I, I think there's definitely a, a strong argument to, you know, just scaling and, and getting as much TVL and Bitcoin into the bridge as possible um, in the short term versus, you know, um, versus like distributing that in the short term. But ultimately, that's up to token holders. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Those are those are my personal views on the on, on the topic as well. Um, it, I, another uh, another great segue here in, in terms of governance. Now, when, when we talk about this threshold council, right, how is this council elected? Um, who can serve as part of it? What requirements are there to, to actually uh, be a part of it as well? Yeah, so it's a, a nine um, nine member committee, or essentially it's a, it's a multi sig um, that has certain um, privileges over parts of the network. So generally, the the council today manages deployed POL. Um, so there's a curve T ETH pool that is managed by the council. Um, the council also has certain um, uh, veto powers over upgrades to the staking contract. Um, so, for example, if, if somehow like a malicious proposal um, was able to pass, say, that like <laughs> dis- sends the entire Dow Treasury to some unknown address, the, the council could step in and veto that. Um, that council is elected by token holders on an annual basis. Um, via a, a vote on snapshot um, and there's not any particular um, requirements other than obviously you have to, to gain a you have to you know, win election um, but it's an open process that, that anyone can can self nominate for got it got it yeah I think I think I think that's a very interesting portion to always explore and I I, I always like when when governance doesn't have these very strict requirements on, on joining councils and like besides elections, right? Like gating people out of the process for not having a certain amount of T tokens or whatever other protocols will typically do. 
uh, you know, typically holds people out of governance, even if they have this, the, the skills on the technical side or the, the ideas on the financial side or, yep. you know, whatever that may be yeah, and, um, to properly push the network along. And there's also um, three other multi-sigs um, that um, have certain roles within threshold governance uh, that are associated with what we call guilds, which are um, probably referred to as sub DAOs, or uh, I don't know if Synthetics has some some similar concept. Um, but there's a marketing guild, an integrations guild, and a treasury guild, which um, are also elected and open to to anyone. Um, the marketing guild obviously is is tasked with you know very broadly just increasing awareness of threshold and its products, including TBTC. Uh, the treasury guild. Um, has certain roles, responsibilities as it relates to the DAO's POL. So um, generally this is like an advisory role and, and the actual POL sits with the council, but the treasury guild can say, you know, hey, like let's deploy like a new pool and balancer or, or whatever. Uh, and then the integrations guild uh, is responsible for uh, almost like a biz dev or sort of um, DAO ambassador type role where they're going out and securing integrations um, with other protocols for, for TBTC, whether it's like liquidity pools or, you know, lending, um, borrow platforms and, and things like that. Yeah, no, I, I, I think those are all very important sub councils to have, um, to, to help further the, the protocol as a whole. Um, Synthetics does have somewhat similar councils. Uh, the, the, the ambassador council is actually uh, the one who's hosting the call is actually serves for this, uh, um, just like integrations and partnerships and, you know, and so on. And then there's, there's a couple other councils that, that, that can be discussed there. Um, but yeah, Millie, I, I know that you just hopped on stage as a speaker. Do, do you have any pressing questions you'd like to uh, ask McLean here? Yes, I do. Thank you, Matt, for bringing me up. I appreciate it. Um, you know what? I actually, Threshold just recently popped up on my radar. So I'm kind of a newbie to like the community. Um, but really interested and I kind of really like the idea of optimistic bridge because I always felt like that's probably the best solution to bridge like canonical BTC to ETH or, or, or so to say. Um, and so like, I, I feel like, you know, it, it's a great solution, but like, I just want to play devil's advocate a little bit here. Um, like from like that Bitcoin maxi perspective, like that they sort of look at it, like what sort of security assumptions are there to reassure the depositors that like, their BTC is like legit BTC and they bring it on onto uh, ETH, even though like it's like a Ethereum based DAO that sort of governs the protocol. Yeah, I mean, look, like obviously like the most secure way to hodl Bitcoin is on the native Bitcoin blockchain. Um, anytime you use a bridge, even if it's TBTC, which you know we think is essentially like the sort of ideal bridge from a security standpoint that's possible today um you know you are making certain assumptions um around you know one like was the bridge from a protocol perspective designed correctly if yes was it implemented correctly um so there are of course you know the risks and i think it's important to be aware of those risks and how the systems that you're using work um Obviously, like everything is you know on chain, so like you can verify that at, at any given moment, does the bridge have sufficient reserves to properly collateralize all the TBTC that's that's been issued and exists? Um, so that's all you know transparent and verifiable. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, we are, are definitely one of the big pushes. Um, now that we're you know post launch is basically collating all the documentation around exactly how everything works and in one place it's easy for people to to review and grok and understand so that they have a an easy way to like get a clear picture of, of exactly um, you know how the thing that they're using works. Awesome. And like in terms of the actual um, TBDC stakers, like what uh, that goes to, like ensure that they're honest actors that like they're not going to be acting maliciously or that, yeah. that they can be subject to a governance attack. Yeah. So V two, uh, what underpins V two is essentially a an honest majority assumption, um, and then what that allows us to do is then we, uh, along with regular wallet rotation. So a new wallet is generated 
um, via a distributed key generation algorithm on a weekly basis. Um, and that's where deposits go. And then if any one wallet is compromised, so let's say uh, 51 of 100 signers on a particular wallet collude and steal Bitcoin, what happens in that scenario is two things. One, uh, those malicious uh, signers are slashed and kicked out of the network. Um, so to the extent that you know they're removed from the network, so they wouldn't be able to do this attack again on, on a future wallet. And then two, there is uh, an insurance backstop called the coverage pools, uh, which is kind of similar to, let's say, like Aave's safety module. Um, and that coverage pool would be drawn down by uh, the threshold council to essentially purchase um, BTC to re-collateralize the protocol um, and make the depositors in that wallet that was compromised um, whole. Got it. And that coverage pool is in um, stable coins? Or? Uh, so currently the coverage pool is uh, in native T, um, POL from the Dow's treasury. Uh, as TVL um, in the bridge uh, increases, I think it's possible that the DAO would incentivize um, deposits in uh, stables, in ETH, uh, potentially in, in other forms of um, a wrapped or synthetic Bitcoin um, as well, just to, to make it more robust. Um, it's actually also an interesting, um, one interesting proposal is to di divert the bridge mint and, and redemption fees um, into uh, the coverage pools. Got it. Awesome. And one other question. So you mentioned like there's a new wallet created every week for deposits. So what happens to the BTC and the old wallets? Do they like uh, all get consolidated later? Or Yeah, so I believe it's a weekly basis. The wallet's rotated. I'm not 100% uh, sure. Um, I have to confirm that. Uh, but no, the wallets, uh, that's for, for new, new deposits. So basically like there's the wallets continue to exist. Um, but just for fresh deposits, a new a new wallet is is created. Got it. And like for redemptions, like I, um, is it like how is it sorted out based on like which wallet gets re redeemed first? Like, is there a special way to, to handle that, or does it really not matter? Like, uh, well, so actually, redemptions are one of the things that um, are are not live yet. So just as a caveat. Uh, currently, you can only bridge to Ethereum, um, and then redemptions will will go live um, around, I believe, around the same time as, as sweeping, um, or maybe slightly after that. Uh, and so, I think that still being implemented. Um, I believe there is some logic around redemptions, um, basically redeeming first from older wallets, um, just to reduce, you know, things like signer set churn and things like that. Nice. Okay. Cool. Makes sense. Awesome. Thank you, Miller, for hopping up. Always, always a pleasure to have you back in uh, in these parts. Um, but McLean, I think the the next step as we as we kind of wrap up is um, anything like any closing thoughts on like the 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 roadmap for threshold in like a summarized state. Like I I, I know we've kind of discussed you know, this further decentralization and sweeping and uh, redemption and so on, but like anything you, you want to chat about on the roadmap um, for the future of Threshold and TBTC? Sure. I mean, I think just the, the vision for TBTC is to just be the maximally trust minimized and decentralized and permissionless bridge uh, for Bitcoin. Um, and I think we have a, a pretty credible roadmap to, to get there. And I think, you know, Probably it is um, best in class already today, um, but we want to make it uh, even better. Um, I think it's also interesting. There's also a few interesting projects that are being built on top of TBTC, which we didn't have time to cover today. But there's a team working on something called Threshold USD, which is uh, similar to Liquidity and LUSD, except you're able to, to mint stables with uh, TBTC um, or essentially borrow against your, your Bitcoin. Um, that's an interesting project um, being built by the Threshold community that uh, you know, hopefully now that the bridge is live, that will be will be coming soon. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I think uh, if 
folks in the audience, if TBTC resonates with you, definitely like minting is live. So you're able to, to mint uh, and get TBTC. There's a, a curve pool that has a gauge with fairly good incentives at the moment. Um, actually, given this is a, a synthetics call, it's, that pool is, is pretty underweight SBTC. So um, you'll probably, if you have, if you're an SBTC or SNX whale and you can, you can get SBTC, you'll probably get a pretty good rate by depositing there. Um, and then, yeah, beyond minting, if you're, if you're interested in, in contributing or getting involved in, in Threshold, the DAO pretty much works out of, out of our Discord. Uh, and, you know, we'd love to, we'd love to see some new faces. That was awesome, McLean. I think I think what you guys are, are trying to do over at TBC is is very necessary, and and, and, and having this this new truly decentralized uh, bridge coming from Bitcoin to using it on Ethereum is is super important. So yeah, guys, please um please make sure to check out um some of the tweets that Synthetix has put out on TBTC, and you know make sure to follow them on Twitter and, and so on, and then uh, yeah, make sure to join their their Discord as well to to follow the conversation, as I know there'll be be some very exciting things coming out of there very soon as the, as the roadmap that McLean has laid out um, is one that will, that, that will really further decentralize this and, and establish it for the future. Um, so yeah, McLean, um, thank you so much for coming on. I, I appreciate talking about TBTC. Um, we will um, put this, uh, put this recording onto YouTube so folks can enjoy it outside of here. Once, uh, once the, the, the link will expire after some amount of days um, so yeah, you guys will be able to check it out over there and, and we'll announce another synthetic Spartan space, uh, relatively soon, but yeah, thank you so much, uh, McLean and, and the folks at Threshold for coming on and, uh, yeah, make sure to check out their, their new developments. So yeah, guys, thank you and, and have a good one. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. And thanks everybody. And, and thanks synthetics for, for being a, a mentioning partner. Mm-hmm.